yeah, this is this is the presentation. And as I said, there's a there's a link um, in Slack to a, a Google Slides version of the same thing. So uh, you guys can follow along with that if you want, rather than sharing the screen. It's it's up to you. Um, so yeah, I've I've been hosting for ten minutes now. Now I'll introduce myself. My name's Mike Smith. Um, so I'm a a software developer at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory um, and I work for a, an organization called the um, <coughs> German Network for Bioinformatics Infrastructure. Um, so I'm really a software developer and, and kind of maybe a data scientist but I'm a programmer by trade rather than a, a scientist. Um, and so the topic of this, this, uh, this talk is working with on-disk data formats um, and I was really uh, excited when Charlotte and Michael approached me to talk about this. Um, it's not something I've ever really seen on the program for a single cell workshop or anything before. Um, but I also wondered whether anybody else would be excited about this. Um, you're excited about the methods, how to interpret your data, how to analyze it, how to make biological conclusions about it. Um, but maybe you've never really thought about how we should store that data on disk. It's a bit more of a dry topic. Um, and so I'm hoping that with this slide, I can like at least motivate you as to why you might be interested in this session if you're not automatically interested. Um, so perhaps uh, you really do just want to use software, you want to know how to analyze things, but you don't care about this particularly at all. In which case, maybe this just helps you understand some of the options that you see in the software you use, right? If it says I'm going to save it in a sparse format, or you make a choice between whether you use an HDF5 file or something along those lines, then hopefully this kind of high level overview explains a little bit about what, why you might want to make those choices and how to make them um, and why they're somewhat important to you. Um, also, the kind of things that you might encounter is that you get hold of a file in a particular format, but you don't really know anything about how it was generated, quite where it came from. Maybe it's got an unusual uh, file extension or something and you don't know how to open it. Um, and uh, that could come from a collaborator or in some supplementary material where the methods section is less than useless and doesn't tell you how to get there. Um, and so hopefully kind of a little overview of the things we do and why this might be like the tools you use to look inside a data might help you understand this kind of file. Um, and then um, sometimes I also want to sort of emphasize that you don't even know you're using on disk data, right? There are certain tools which will work completely seamlessly with um, particular file formats on disk. Um, and you as a user might never really understand or really comprehend that you're using them. Um, and that's great, it's seamless, it works really nicely. Um, but you might also encounter unusual errors that reference things um, that you weren't expecting. And so having some idea of how this works might be useful to you going forwards. Um, and then I guess finally, if instead of being a, a pure sort of biological user, but you're in fact a methods developer, you want to look into these data sets, um, and you want to either write new statistical methodology for them um, or uh, you want to pull out information that nobody else has looked at but you know is produced by the, by the scientific equipment and things, um, then it's really useful to be able to understand these file formats. Um, and if you're interested in performance of how well things will run, how quickly they run, um, then having a really good understanding of how these formats work um, is really important to uh, impacting the performance of those kinds of things. So if you fall into that category, um, it's really useful to have a, a solid understanding of how the data are on disk. Um, and to just kind of uh, uh, emphasize, I guess, these last two points um, about the kind of sometimes you don't know you're using on disk data um, and also about methods development. This is kind of just a little um, schematic of one of the software stacks within the Bioconductor project. Um, so you guys have already seen um, single cell experiments here, um, and maybe you've used some of the tools that fall at this end. Um, but actually underpinning a single cell experiment could be uh, an HDF5 array object, which interacts with a package, which interacts with a C library, which then interacts with a file on your disk called an HDF5 file. Um, and there are multiple authors of these packages um, always within this stack and if you fall into the category up here of either a user or a developer of these things you probably don't know who to talk to down here or necessarily even care that you're basing your work upon all of these things you just want it to work um, but i kind of just wanted to emphasize that uh, sometimes you can be um, 
utilizing these kind of on, on disk things in ways which you aren't necessarily expecting. Um, and hopefully this introduces the topic to you guys. Um, so I guess now we should move on to, um, before we really talk about on disk things, we're gonna talk about uh, just general strategies for uh, representing count matrices. Um, and so, yeah, with single cell data, it's all about the count matrix, right? You guys know that, you probably know it better than me, you guys work with this more frequently than I do. Um, but the, the count matrix is the, the big bulk of data in single cell. Um, experimental data, um, certainly for the most cases that's true. Um, and it has one particular very special property, which is this sparsity, right? And it kind of pervades everything to do with the single cell analysis, right? So I'm sure you guys, as I say, know better than I do, but the, the biological interpretation of things, right? Whether it's truly zero expression or um, just a technical artifact, that's uh, something that the sparsity impacts how you, how you do that. It impacts the statistical analysis, right? All the previous lectures you've talked about, things you know already. Um, how you model things, um, and this is all related again to the, the previous step about is it truly uh, not there or is it an artifact of the, um, uh, of the experimental technique. Um, so those are kind of the analytical side of things, but this also affects the, the software that we manipulate these data with. Um, so I think there was a question um, on the first day about sparse matrices. So I guess at least some people are, are well aware of that these exist. Um, and we're going to talk about them in a bit more depth in the next few slides, but um, people can make choices about whether they represent things in sparse matrices or dense matrices and that kind of thing within software. Um, and that's, again, related to the fact that these count matrices are exceedingly sparse um, and there are properties you can manipulate. Um, and then I guess the final point really is that this also influences how we can store and transfer things. Um, because of this sparsity, we can exploit that um, and make certain choices about how we access the data or move it around to be more efficient than we might be in a, in a completely naive case. Um, so yeah, we're re really gonna focus on um, the count matrix, um, at least for the, the first part of this talk um, and strategies for using those. So let's just actually consider, um, when we're not really talking in, in on disk here, I'm just going to talk about in general ways of representing matrices. Um, and I guess the, the obvious is this 2D grid, right? Everybody's seen this and you'll understand why I'm coloring it in a little bit in a few slides time. Um, but this is a moderately sparse matrix. Um, I kind of wish I'd made it sparser by the time I get four slides time. Um, but this is the obvious representation, right? We have rows and columns. There are values in there. Quite a lot of them are zeros. Um, You've all seen this before. This is pretty small for single cell data, I think you would agree, um, but it works in our little cartoon form. Um, and this is the kind of standard dense matrix. If you just read, if you create a matrix in R uh, or in Python or any other language, this is pretty much how it will be represented. There will really be an entry for every element in there, um, and uh, then it takes up a, a certain amount of space in memory and that kind of thing. So. If we just have a little think about um, how much memory this might consume. Um, so in this case, our little cartoon has only got five rows, but if we think about a sort of typical human um, single cell experiment, we're talking more like 30,000 rows um, for 30,000 genes. It might be different if you have multiple organisms or your Kazarian transcripts or something, but let's, let's go with an approximation of 30,000 rows. Um, and then each of the elements stored in here is, a, is an integer, so that's four bytes. So for one column, you need 120 kilobytes, which is nothing, right? We don't even think about whether you can assign that anymore in a computer. We probably didn't think about that 25 years ago either. Um, it's pretty small. So for one column, it's totally fine. Um, but in our dense matrices, that, those requirements scale linearly. So um, if you now need 100 columns, suddenly we're at 12 megabytes of memory. Um, which is also fine, right? That's um, considerably less than your laptop has. It's, it's no worries whatsoever. Um, every time you open a tab in Chrome, it will consume considerably more than that. Um, but if we jump up another couple of orders of magnitude, so now we're at 10,000 um, genes, suddenly we need 1.2 gigabytes. And we're starting to enter the point where this is a bit more challenging to, to manipulate and look after. So, um, uh, 
for instance, we've been creating instances in, in Renku with four gigs of RAM. This would just about work in there, but if you use a language like R, it's pretty easy to make a copy of something. Suddenly, we're actually at nearly two and a half gigabytes, and if you've got anything else going on in your machine, it might be tough to do an analysis um, with 10,000 cells, which is not a particularly big uh, experimental thing. Um, and then if we, if we, I've missed out one row here, but if we were to do 100,000 columns, right, 12 gigs, um, we couldn't do that in our Renku engines here. Um, and I think most of us would probably struggle on our laptops to do that. Um, I have 16 gigs of RAM, so you could read it in, but you couldn't really do much with it, uh, at least not naively. Um, and then if we kind of take it to the largest sorts of experiments that uh, are coming out now, so a million cells, um, suddenly you need 120 gigs of, of RAM to do this. And we're not talking anywhere. Nobody's desktop has that. You might have one or two machines in your institute that can do it, um, but you're probably competing with some other researchers for those resources and things. Um, so it starts to get into the realm where just doing this in memory is, is kind of an infeasible. Um, at least if we employ this kind of naive dense matrix strategy. So I guess one thing we can consider and um, is pretty typically done is instead some sort of sparse representation. Um, and I guess the most obvious way of going about this um, is to um, throw away all the zeros. Um, so in this case, that's what this vector at the top here has done. And we can ignore the coloring just for now. Um, but what's stored in this vector here are just the non-zero elements from our matrix. Um, and then we can store, to recapitulate the original matrix, we can store the indices of where these values came from. So for instance, uh, and we're going to use zero-based notation here, um, so the language gets tricky, but these, these first two elements here, they reference the first row and the first column and then value 10, right? And the same going through all of this. Um, and so from these three vectors here, we can recapitulate our matrix. Um, this isn't a great example because we actually use more values in these three matrices, uh, three, three vectors than we use to represent the whole matrix here. Um, and so the more sparse it is, the better this, this compression would work. Um, but we can actually do better than this relatively simply as well. So you'll notice that in the, the column indices, there's lots of repeating elements, right? And these, these repeating elements match the colors, which match the, match the columns, right? There, there's three different ways of encoding the same data here. Um, but yeah, the, uh, this column indices has lots of replication in it. Um, and we don't actually need to do that. We can be slightly more efficient um, without making this much more complicated. Um, so uh, we can actually, because we don't need that replication going on here, instead of making these the actual indices and referring back to the original matrix, we can make them refer to these row indices instead. And basically, uh, say which element in our row index vector is the first one for each column. So in this case, the, the yellow block right tells us that the first element here. Uh, okay, so I will come to Leon's question in just a second, because um, I had to look it up yesterday to, to make this example. Um, but just for now, the, um, uh, so the, yeah, the first element here tells us that the first element in this is for row one, oh, sorry, for column one. Then the second element here tells us to jump to the third part here and all of these. And so this continues through and we have to have one at the end which marks the very, uh, off the end, it's the very last element in our, in our vector. So you end up with one more element in this column pointers than we have columns in the matrix. Um, so there's a question from Leon, which is how does this handle empty columns? Um, and the answer is that it will still have a, it depends where they appear, but basically you repeat the value in here um, and nothing appears in the row of indices. Um, so it, it's, it's a, um, there are probably other ways of getting around this, but you can essentially, um, uh, if you would just have a completely empty, well, if you have one empty ma um, matrix, you would just put a, for instance, if there was nothing in here at all, uh, this would stay, this would, uh, what would this do? This would become zero, um, but it would, uh, let me write an answer for you in the Slack. Um, but uh, yeah, essentially you end up repeating the values in here um, 
to handle empty columns, but don't worry about it, it can handle them. Um, so does this make sense to people? Put your hand up if this makes sense. So you can untick, let me clear everybody. And now say yes if this, because I'm going to ask you to recapitulate things in the exercises. Um, so we can go through it again later, um, but I kind of just wanted to show that you have this, this sparse representation um, to represent things. And whilst I've not done a particularly good uh, example here, because we use, uh, there's 25 integers stored here, uh, and in our example here, it's, uh, what's this, it's 14, and then 28, and then 34. So we've actually made it worse. Um, but hopefully you can see that uh, the more zeros there are, the smaller these two will get, right? Because these are the same length as the number of non-zero elements. So uh, if there was only one element in here, each of these would only be uh, of length one. Um, and so it, the, the sparser it gets, the better this is at, at representing your matrix in a more compressed form. Um, and actually this is summarized on this next slide here, right? So the, the worst case scenario where it's not sparse at all, we end up with three vectors, um, all of which are the same length as the entire uh, matrix. Um, and we end up with three times the storage. So that would be a terrible situation and you really wouldn't ever want to do that. Um, but in the best case, it's, it's pretty much equivalent to one row, which is that you would fill in the column index thing full of zeros. Um, and there's probably a clever way of just representing a, a zero and then the number of times it appears or something. You would put an exception in for the very best case. Um, but in naively, it would be equivalent to just one row of the matrix, which would be a pretty good compression. Um, so yeah, we're gonna focus a bit more on that in one of the exercises um, and try and uh, sort of recreate that algorithm I've just talked you through there. But I wanted to explain this because um, it will be a repeating uh, thing that we see in these kind of on-disk data representations. Um, and so, yeah, that brings me to the, what about on disk? Everything I've been talking about here has just been theoretical about how to represent matrices. Um, but at some point you want to um, save or share these counts, right? So what we've been doing so far has been, maybe this is on disk, maybe it's in memory or whatever, but now we're being explicit. You want to save these somewhere and you want to share them with either your collaborators or you need to take them from your machine that produced the original counts or whatever. Um, and give them to some, somewhere else to do an analysis. Um, so you need to think about how they're going to be stored. Um, and then you also occasionally, as we said in, in our sort of example of a million cells, sometimes the data are just too big to ever be read into memory, right? You want to work on them on your laptop, um, but you don't have 120 gigs of RAM. And so there needs to be some strategies for both moving them around, but then also uh, allowing people to kind of jump in and access subsets of the data or work on it in a way that is um, feasible on a laptop that isn't um, a supercomputer. Um, and uh, so this, this sounds like a relatively simple, straightforward problem, um, except that there's no consensus in the field uh, for how to go about doing this. Um, and I'm sure if you guys have seen data from more than one um, uh, manufacturer or run it through multiple different um, analysis tools and things, um, you will have encountered this. Even from one manufacturer, you can get the data in different um, uh, formats and things. So um, just a few different examples here. So um, the uh, MEX files, which is, stands for market exchange format, these, these come from uh, 10x cell ranger software. Um, so they use this kind of sparse format, so the three three vectors. Um, there are actually three columns in a text file. Um, and then they zip up the text file and give that to you. Um, but you can also, from the same um, software, output an HDF5 file, um, which also uses this sparse format. So it stores the, the same kind of the three columns, but in a completely different file format. Um, and um, then I guess you guys on day one used um, 11, um, which has its own output format. I think um, it was in the, the file, it's actually called a quants underscore mat dot gz, um, but it uses their own representation of this sparse three column thing again. Um, but it's different, it's different from the two above. Um, and then there is kind of the alternative strategy where, um, uh, for instance, if you've ever encountered a loom file, 
it does the same kind of job. It moves count matrices around for you along with some extra data, but they actually mandate that it has to be a dense matrix. It doesn't use this sparse representation at all and uses other techniques that we're going to talk about a bit for making that efficient. Um, and then something like the single cell experiment, which I guess you guys have encountered and we had on one of the early slides. So this is the sort of biocon bioconductors um, object for representing single cell data. They can actually use, amongst other things, um, HDF5 files that are either dense or sparse, um, and they can use the same things in memory as well. So you kind of, you can be very flexible in that framework. Um, but what it does mean is that it's, there's no uh, clear cut choice from the community uh, about what the best way of moving this data or manipulating it is. Um, and we've also reached the point where um, I struggle to use the correct language here. So I talk about HDF5 files and that's a particular file format. But then we also talk about, for instance, Loom files as being a file format, but they are HDF5 files. Um, I tried to see if there was a technical, uh, a proper computer science um, terminology for um, when is it sort of a file format and when is it a file scheme or something. There doesn't seem to be a consensus there. So we just call everything a file format. Um, but I guess it's, it's kind of important there's this kind of distinction between low level, um, very general purpose file formats. Um, so the very first example on this slide, the text file would count as that, right? You can use a text file to pretty much do whatever you want. Um, it doesn't have to be anything to do with single cell data. And the same applies in HDF5 files. That is a, a fairly general purpose file format um, that you could use for all sorts of things but people build on top of those and say, this is a specific layout of those file types for maneuvering, um, in our case, um, count matrices. So you can have a text file and if you mandate it has three columns and they represent these three things of the data and the row indexes and the column indexes, that's a new file type. Um, and the same with loom files, right? They are one specific, well-structured um, and hopefully well-documented layout um, of an HDF5 file. Um, so yeah, I find that sometimes a bit, uh, uh, you, you need a little bit more language to explain that this is not just an HDF5 file, but it's of a particular type or structure. Um, and yeah, as we see even two different, um, or three different manufacturers here, different um, projects and that kind of thing, produce HDF5 files that have different internal structures and even to the point where they, they represent the, the matrices in completely different ways. Um, so hopefully, um, that's kind of an overview of, of how we store these matrices. Um, and now the, the rest of the talk, we're gonna focus most, almost explicitly um, on um, HDF5. Um, so I'm, I'm actually the author of a package that can read these in R and things. That's why the focus is on this. Um, and it's probably also the most, uh, it's got the most market share, I would say, in, um, uh, in single cell data sets. But there are plenty of other uh, projects and efforts and things uh, where people are exploring other file formats, but they all kind of have the same concepts in the background as to um, why they're better than just dumping it into a text file and zipping it up. Um, so yeah, with that, I will um, introduce the, uh, um, the HDF5 format to you guys. So- I think you have a question from Simon. Uh, maybe Simon, you would like to elaborate a bit on that question just? Uh, yes, go for it. So it, where is where is the question? I can see the chat, but not the, is it in Slack? Uh, yeah, exactly. I c yeah, you have it in the Slack channel. Yeah, I can read it for you otherwise if you want to. Uh, let me put it on my second window. Yeah, that's all right. I can ask the question directly. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I was just wondering, I mean, following your logic, you could also get rid of the second I mean, one of the two indexes, no? If you use linear indexes for your matrices, that would be even more compact. Uh, sorry, let me go back to, so, so whereabouts is this? Here, yes. You don't need to have row and columns. You could have only one of the two. Yes, and you said the first one is zero and then the last one is five. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, you're right. You, you could, you can consider this as just a, uh, one single. So I guess you still need to know something about the structure of the, of the, course, the overall yes. number of rows and columns. Um, and also, I guess you could run into limitations where um, 
Yes, so you could have the difference of indexes in this sense, no? Uh, yeah, you, you want to have an overflow. Yes, so I don't know whether that, so this isn't the strategy that's normally used, which must mean that there is a good reason why it's not the strategy that's normally used, because you're right, you could, um, so what I was initially going to say for, for those who aren't following between the gaps in our conversation here, um, is that um, you, if you just had a single linear index, you could easily run out of basically the, the, the number of elements you could reference. So if your matrix is big enough, you can't use an integer to find the right space in it. Whereas if you have rows and columns, you get more flexibility, the, the size could be larger. Um, but then, sorry, is it Simon? Is that who I'm talking to? Yes, yes, yes. yes yeah, yeah. So as Simon, um, Simon said, you could actually just store the differences between um, things, which hopefully then that wouldn't be greater than the total number of, uh, or the, the largest integer you can represent. Um, I wonder if that impacts uh, how easily you can get information out, because you would have to start at the beginning and keep working, um, like you'd have to read through it from the beginning the whole way. I don't know if that would be a, because uh, you would always need to work out the difference to find out a particular element. So you'd always have to start in the top left-hand corner and calculate. Um, yeah, I don't know whether wh why that would be, where that would slow down. But all I can say is that that is the uh, that is not the kind of standard. So if you create a DGC matrix in in the matrix package in R, for instance, um, that's not one of the options it uses. I don't think. Does that? Does that go any way to answering your question? Yeah, yeah, I was wondering exactly this, you know, why is this not an, an option or a typical strategy? And I guess it's... Yeah, yeah I, th I think because if you, the performance would be, I, I haven't thought about this too much, but I guess the performance would be really bad if you needed to get something near the, let's say, end, so the bottom right-hand corner of our matrix here, um, because you'd have to keep working all the way through to find the, that particular element. Um, that would be my suggestion as to why yeah, that's thanks. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so well, I'm just going to now introduce the, um, the HDF5 file format. So you guys have probably seen them at least at some point, um, because a lot of, um, these tools use them and certainly, um, uh, Charlotte introduced the AM data format yesterday, which, um, is one particular example um, that I didn't actually mention on the previous slide, but that uses um, the HDF5 format to represent its data. Um, and so the name stands for hierarchical data format, and unsurprisingly, it's, it's version 5. Um, and within those files, right, the hierarchical part of this, um, mean it, it basically indicates that inside the file, um, you can have a, a, a tree kind of structure, just like you have um, on a sort of standard file system, um, where there are two basic elements, there are groups and there are data sets. And you can pretty much think of groups as being like folders. They, as the name suggests, they group things together. Um, and the data sets are like files, so they're the kind of endpoints. Um, they can't have things nested inside them. Um, but you can build arbitrarily complex um, uh, uh, tree structures within these so you can have as many layers of nesting and you can have in between group relationships and this kind of thing. Um, I think a lot of the time people don't exploit that um, possibly because it makes it too complicated um, but one neat thing is that you can use this to for instance bundle all of the different aspects um, of a particular experiment or data set or something together into a single file um, and we'll see a few examples of that um, as we work through, but um, I guess we saw some examples in this in the AND data file from from Charlotte yesterday, where there was the kind of raw data, and then people had done some embeddings, and there were um, I think someone asked the question about where X underscore PCA had come from, and those kinds of things, and those were sort of later additions to the analysis, but they were now all available in the same file, um, and so you can use these groups um, to collect things together that were done on the same day or were done, um, you know, the pre-process data and then the post-process data and then um, the summarized data can be stored later. You run into the same questions as you do with how you should organize files when you're in hard disk and you can make arbitrary choices about those kinds of things. Um, but what it does do is let you store and collect lots of data together um, in a single file format. Um, 
And I, I call this self-describing as well, because every element within the file, including the top level element of the file, um, they can all have metadata attached to them. So you can store things um, that relate to the data sets or the groups. So for instance, you could store in the metadata the time something was run or the date it was run on or the name of the person that was using it in the top level. You could store the file version number so that um, somebody who's writing some software for it later can check whether this is version one or version two of your file format and that kind of thing. Um, and everything in here can be named as well. So you can, um, it's only as good as, um, as the naming quality is, right? Just like all documentation, um, you can give things bad names and it doesn't really explain things to somebody later, but you can give them sensible names that people can read and understand what the data or the structure is. Um, and HDF5 gives you all of this kind of flexibility uh, within its, its framework. Um, and to just kind of uh, show a little example of that, um, this is from, um, these, these examples are just taken from um, 10x Cell Ranger's own uh, help web pages. Um, but, uh, and they're, they're for slightly different versions of the software, so it doesn't match up exactly. But on the, on the left, uh, this is basically, this, this top level element here is a folder. Um, and inside the folder, there would be another folder um, with the, the name of the genome. And then inside that, there would be a load of files. Um, and this represents account matrix for from their cell ranger software um, and um, this this is the the mex uh, exchange format thing that i talked about before which is basically just a text file with the sparse representation and if you looked inside that you get you get this so there's a little header and things um, and then there's basically three columns which are the column indices the row indices and the values for each of the cells um, Oh uh, yeah, I see there's a hand raised, Simon. Yes, sorry. Um, okay. it, it, it's a bit confusing, no? Because in a sense, this file format doesn't tell you anything about how the, the file is actually stored on this. I mean, here you, you could put matrix.mtx could be some kind of arbitrary encoding that nobody else than myself could read. Yep, absolutely. Um, so you basically rely on um, uh, that they have defined or somebody somewhere has defined what an MTX file is and that whoever writes this out obeys the kind of rules that have been specified by someone. Um, but yeah, you can, you could easily mess this up. You, you could miss a column out or have a blank space or something. And depending upon how good the software that reads it later is, it could handle that well or handle it badly. Um, but it is essentially just a text file um, and you could do whatever you want with it. Um, uh, and I guess the point really that I was, I was sort of conveying here as well is that there's three files, which in this case, this is the, this is the actual data in our sparse kind of format. And then we have these two extra things here, which are the, the barcodes, which are going to be the column names and then the genes, which are the, the row names. And all of these could be used to recapitulate our kind of in memory thing that we're normally used to working with in an R session. Um, and actually on the right hand side is an HDF5 file that pretty much uh, is so it's one file instead of a particular folder, but it stores very similar information. Um, some of which has useful names and can, you can easily match them up. So for instance, there's a, there's a data set called barcodes and that will have the same content as this TSV file over here. Um, and then we have the, the matrix with our three columns and actually they use slightly different names here, but there's a data set called data, which are the, the values for each of the cells the indices, which are the, the row indices that we saw as so our second kind of long vector. Uh, and then the, uh, in this case, the uh, indices pointers, which we call column pointers in my little cartoon, um, which is the third slightly smaller vector. So the, these could all, these basically represent the same things as in this file here. Um, and then there's also an element called shape, which tells us um, uh, how, what actual dimensions the matrix is gonna be. And then the final thing that's, um, there's another file, right? This genes one, um, and actually in the slightly newer versions of Cell Ranger, they give you a little bit more information, but that's stored in this features group, which has extra bits underneath it. Um, so this gives you the genome version, which I guess here was encoded in a folder name, and maybe it's better to have it explicitly written in a place called genome rather than relying on somebody not renaming the folder or something along those lines. Um, and then this, uh, this is a gene ID, an ensemble gene ID, and this is the, um, the, the actual gene name, uh, which I guess depends upon what organism you're using and that kind of thing. 
Um, but this really just wanted to show that you can get data out of a piece of software like Cell Ranger, and it's essentially the same data, but in two different formats. And it can either be in one single HDF5 file or uh, a bunch of files stored in a, in a folder. Um, and that hierarchical structure of HDF5 lets you kind of recapitulate with that. Um, and just to sort of hammer home the point a little bit more, uh, there's a piece of software which um, comes from the HDF5 group called HDF View. Um, if you install this, you can double click on HDF5 files and it lets you browse around and look inside them and things. And again, you can kind of, uh, the left hand panel here is again this exact same um, structure of um, the, the hierarchical nature. You can open the groups and have a look at the dimensions and that sort of thing. Um, we won't use this today. We'll use some software tools to do the same kind of job. Um, but I always have this um, uh, available so that I can double click on these files and browse around. Sometimes that's easier than using a command line tool. Um, so what I've talked about there has been very much um, about HDF5. Um, it's been explicit to that. Most other strategies for storing things on disk don't have this hierarchical nature. Um, but um, I don't want to kind of dissuade you from using other tools and things. Um, HDF5 is relatively old now, um, and there's lots of efforts to come up with other ways of storing data in perhaps more efficient um, or mod modern ways. Um, and they have lots of the same properties. So the kind of elements we're going to do now um, are, they are the examples will be specific to HDF5, but the kind of concepts and theory behind them um, actually apply to lots of different file formats like TileDB or Apache Parquet. Um, so if you've ever sort of tried to use those kind of things, they're trying to do things in similar fashions, but with perhaps slightly different technologies and that kind of stuff. Um, and so some of the features you're sort of looking for in these ways that you can store this data on disk in a more efficient, more effective way. Um, so really efficient access to um, subsets um, of that data. So we talked about how sometimes you can't read the whole thing into memory. So you really want to be able to jump into a large data set and effectively pull out um, the bits you want uh, without having to spend lots of time reading things that you aren't interested in at all. Um, it's also useful if you can compress the data, and whether that's through a clever representation like our sparse matrices, or using something uh, more naive like essentially a zip file or something. Um, probably you want it to be a little bit more sophisticated than that, but it's it's a useful um, property to have. And we're going to explore these top two in a few examples uh, in a in a minute. Um, but also advantage of these things, right? You can store heterogeneous data, so you can store uh, text and things alongside. Um, or images alongside the raw data, the raw numbers, um, which is helpful for kind of the metadata and later analysis and that sort of thing. Uh, you also want it to be platform independent. Um, you, your, your users and the people that you're sharing the data with could be using Windows or Linux or Mac or whatever. And so um, it's useful to be able to kind of move this around without worrying about it. And probably also a file format that has interfaces in many languages. So we've been switching pretty seamlessly between Python and R in this course. Um, and certainly HDF5 um, can do that. So we're going to only work in R for our session. But if you're a Python programmer, almost everything we do there, there is an analogous um, uh, piece of software in Python uh, that you can do the same tasks with. Um, I guess one major drawback about all of these strategies, um, and particularly HDF5, is they're complex libraries. And they require you to install something else on the system uh, to access them and to do this interface with other things, which makes it more difficult for users sometimes. Um, so uh, that's kind of one major drawback. They're not just a text file. You can't just give them to people and they double click on them and it just opens right there. You have to go and install the HDF5 software and you have to have that available when you use something like the RHDF5 package to, to interface with them. Um, but hopefully this convinces you that the kind of trade-offs, the benefits are, are worth that little headache uh, of getting people's systems set up to work with it. Um, so now we're just going to consider um, a single data set. So I've talked about the benefits of all this hierarchy and stuff, but we're, we're just not going to um, uh, look at that now. We're just going to think about a single 2D dense count matrix. So no clever representations or anything, just the kind of naive, this is a 2D matrix. Um, how is it stored on disk um, and how do you uh, how does HDF5 meet these kind of benefits of efficient subsetting and, and access? Um, so let's just consider how you save a, a dense matrix normally without any uh, extra bits from HDF5. And uh, our example here is a 20 by 20 matrix. 
Um, you don't need to go and count it or anything, just trust me. Um, but it, um, in, on disk, like uh, conceptually, it's like this, it's two dimensions. But on disk, this would just be stored as a, a single long stream of bytes, right? There is no dimensionality on your disk. Um, so it's just going to be, uh, it would start in this corner and basically the first row will be saved. Let's say for now we store this row, row wise, first row will be saved and the next and the next after each other in a long linear fashion. Um, and what this means is that it's pretty fast to read a single row out from this kind of structure. Because all you need to do is find the first place and then you can do one read operation. You say how many things you want to read. Um, so in this case, we would read 20 elements and we know where it starts. It's this 21st element, the first element of the second row, and we'd read it all. Um, and that, that's pretty quick, actually. Um, and so this isn't a terrible situation if all you want to do is read out individual rows, for instance. Um, so that's our subsetting operation here. Um, but it, it's terrible if what you want to do is read out individual columns. Um, so in this case, because it's laid out in one long linear fashion, um, if you want to read a single column, you jump to an element, you read that element, and then you have to jump a whole row, so another 20 elements to get to the 22nd, I guess in this example, read that one, jump again, jump again, piece all that back together again. So you end up doing 20 separate read operations where you have to find them, find the right place in the file, read that data out, and recapitulate it. Um, and this is really inefficient. So if, if this is your layout, then the column reading is a really bad way of, of, of or it's a really bad access pattern. Um, and so if you were to just dump out like a matrix into a, a binary file somewhere, um, it's really good to go in one direction and really bad to go in another. Um, and that's not optimal at all. Um, and so the strategy HDF5 um, has for trying to um, mitigate this is that these data sets are not actually stored as one big contiguous block of data, um, but actually they're stored into chunks. So I've just colored these in. The colors uh, are just meant to highlight where they are, but don't think that blue ones are necessarily related to each other or anything like that. Um, so I've split our data instead of one big 20 by 20 matrix, it's now 16 smaller five by five matrices. Um, and actually, whilst they still look like they're one big block here, um, on disk, they're not stored like that. They're actually stored completely separately of each other. Um, and the HDF5 file and the kind of infrastructure that surrounds that keeps track of where these blocks are um, on disk and where they would be relative to each other in the overall shape of the data set. So you as a, as a user or a programmer or whatever doesn't need to um, actually worry about keeping track of these kinds of things. You just need to know that uh, the HDF5 is doing that in the background. So you would still interact with it like a single big matrix. Um, but in reality, it's stored in this kind of uh, distributed way on disk. And the advantage of this strategy is that um, it allows you to jump in to each block. Um, and you only need to read the chunks that are actually necessary for the subset you're interested in. So in our little example here, if you're um, if you're interested only in this one particular element here, so what's this, the, the third row, second column, um, the only bit you would need to read is this chunk here, and you can ignore the rest of the file entirely. Um, and so that's, that's certainly more efficient from a memory point of view in that you don't need to read it all in and then find the subset. Um, perhaps it's not quite as good as our continuous thing before if you could just jump in and read one, one element. Um, but our example before, we used the column access as a, a really bad strategy. Um, and so if we consider that here, right, if, if we want to read the first two columns, um, we actually don't need to jump around. There's four seek operations, uh, which are to find the first element in these four blocks. And all we're going to do is read those four. So in this particular example here, we would read a quarter of the data and we'd only do four seek operations. Um, and so this is, this is much more effective than the kind of layout we had before. And you can see that if the size of our matrix grew, but we still only wanted a small subset, the benefits of this approach get, get more and more um, dramatic. So if there was um, 100 blocks here, we'd still only need to read the first, uh, yeah, 100 columns of, of blocks here or something, we would still only need to read the first four to get out this data. Um, and so this is, this is the, the primary thing behind why HDF5 is really useful for letting you get hold of subsets of data. Um, and, and work with it in a sort of effective and efficient way, both speed and memory-wise. 
Um, and up till now, I've been drawing square blocks um, in a square matrix, um, but they don't have to be. Um, so um, your, your blocks can be basically whatever regular shape um, that you want them to be. So in this example, um, our chunks can be contain entire rows um, and multiple rows at the same time, but not uh, span across columns and that kind of thing. Um, and similarly, uh, you could switch and have them narrower and you, you ch chunk things up uh, into columns um, and have a totally different um, uh, way that it's stored on disk. But ultimately, they're all 20 by 20 matrices that kind of look the same uh, programmatically. And so then you might now be thinking, well, why, why would you do this? Um, and how would I pick these chunk dimensions if I cared about it? Um, and the reason that you, you want to think about this if you're writing data or, or reading data, in fact, is that you want to, um, that the, the size and shape of these chunks can really impact the efficiency with which you can get data out. Um, and if you know how you're going to access that data, you can really tailor the chunk shape to match those access patterns. Um, and so we'll see some examples in the exercises of this. Um, but yeah, if you knew you only ever wanted to get columns out, um, picking a structure where the chunks contain whole columns and not very many rows um, would be a really good strategy. Um, and if you knew that you only ever wanted to get rows out, likewise, that strategy would work. Um, if you don't know or you, okay, yeah, sorry, uh, Dania, there's a hand up. Sorry, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. with the examples where you have the whole chunk as a column, is that bad if you want to access the diagonal of the matrix that you have to use all of the chunks? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, that would be, uh, you would end up, if you wanted the diagonal of the matrix, yeah, you'd end up reading, so we'll, we'll see a few examples, but you would end up reading the entire matrix and it would not be a very effective strategy. Um, and so I guess uh, um, my middle, my, well, my, my third point here is the, um, if you don't know, or um, you have a, a strategy like this, where it's kind of actually you want um, both rows and columns, then either square shapes or something that's proportional to the ratio of your matrix are probably kind of a, a decent compromise. Um, there is definitely a compromise to be made there, um, and it really does come down to uh, if you know in advance, then you can tailor how you want to do this. The same for if you know you're going to be picking out large numbers of elements versus like individual points from a data set, um, then that can also uh, impact. Um, the best strategy for doing this. Um, does that answer the question? Yes, thanks. Great. And Simon? Yes, I was wondering how this chunk strategy adapts to sparse matrices because then you don't know a priori the number of elements if you start to populate your matrix. And so I was wondering how do they deal with this? Uh, yeah, so um, my very last slide will have a, a brief touch on the sparse matrices thing. So I will come back to that uh, right at the end, if that's OK. Um, yeah, so and then the, I guess the final two bullet points here, right? Like there might be a temptation um, that you want big chunks. So you have to, there's an overhead in trying to find where the chunks are and things. Um, but um, the caveat is that you do have to read the entire chunk, even for a single element. So you don't want to make them too big because um, I guess the best strategy would be to make the whole file, or the most extreme case would be to make the whole file one chunk, um, but then you read the whole file every time, um, and that's, that's really not effective. Um, uh, so then maybe you think, I want them to be small, too small, but then there's this overhead to actually finding them and keeping track of them in the file and that kind of thing. So you don't want to make too many of them either, um, because then uh, you spend so much time finding where the chunks are that it actually outweighs the time it would take to just read slightly fewer but larger chunks. Uh, so there's always a trade-off here. And to be honest, most people just end up with some kind of middle ground. Um, I hope it's fine. Um, but I kind of just wanted to emphasize that sometimes this, uh, this is really, it's a useful thing to be aware of. And it can really, we'll see in the examples, it can make a huge difference to relatively trivial operations um, if you know in advance uh, what your access patterns are going to be. Um, and so the second part of this, um, so you have these chunks. Um, and actually, in addition to sort of storing them in different places, uh, the chunks can also get processed by what, what's called filters in HDF5's um, parlance. But 
Um, these are usually, so they're, they're just something that manipulate the data in some way, um, but they're almost always used for compression. Um, so you take your chunk from memory, you pass it through things, which will basically make it smaller. So in this case, the shuffle operation moves the bytes around so that the, uh, essentially the, the zeros are at one end and um, the ones are at the other end. It's, it's a bit more subtle than that, but essentially that's what the shuffle operation is trying to do. Um, and then we compress it with gzip, which is just the kind of standard um, relatively naive uh, compression op operation um, before we store it on disk. And then to get it back out, when you read the file, it does the same operations, but in the opposite direction. Um, and this, you, you can insert other uh, filters here and things, um, but I would shy away from using other filters um, most of the time, because really these are the ones which are shipped with HDF5. And if you use anything else, which is specific to your data and might look really good, you kind of can't guarantee that your users will have it on their system to read it again. Um, I sometimes get questions um, from users who, who they try to use our HDF5 to read an HDF5 file, and it tells them that they can't because it's been encoded and a, a filter has been used by whoever wrote the file that they don't have on their system. Um, so you can explore those options, but for now, um, I would suggest just sticking with the kind of defaults that use things that are available on almost every uh, everybody's system. Um, but it's this, this compression strategy, which is why it's okay to still store the dense matrices, right? So up till now, I, I kind of introduced this sparse layout and then spent a long time talking about why HDF5 doesn't necessarily need to use it. Um, but this compression thing, um, is pretty good on the spot, even this kind of level of sparse matrices, right? So there's there's lots of zeros in there. An algorithm like GZIP does a pretty good job of compressing those. Um, and our data sets, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what I would say. Um, I know 150 gigs in, in memory comes to about three and a half gigs on disk, that kind of difference. So we're, it's at least an order of magnitude, but it, it's obviously relative to um, several factors in here. Uh, one of which is how sparse it is um, and what level of compression you use like gzip even if you use that algorithm has options from very fast to very slow but very but, but more effective compression um, and then the effectiveness of this compression is also relative to the size of the chunks you pick so it's another part of the kind of balance you need to make um, where uh, if your chunks are all of size one they won't compress at all right you can't do anything with making a single value smaller than it already is um, and if you have one massive chunk that is the whole uh, file, that's actually going to compress the best. You'll end up with the smallest file at the end. But it throws away all of these kind of fancy subsetting and, and random access options that we had before. Um, so that's probably not a good strategy either to have this single chunk. I would never really recommend using a single chunk unless your data are very small. Um, but this is kind of the, um, the reason why we can get away with using a dense matrix. Um, even in, a, in the HDF5 file. Um, but that isn't to say that the benefits don't necessarily apply if you're kind of using an HDF5 file, but storing our three vectors that we saw before. Um, so in this case, the three vectors for us kind of sparse representation, they're each distinct data sets. Um, so we've been talking about 2D matrices. In this case, they're just one dimensional vectors, um, but they can still be chunked. Um, so this time the coloring rep are some kind of chunk, they can be whatever you want. Again, you can choose the dimensions and things, um, but you still get this same benefit of chunking and compression, which won't be as effective as when there's lots of zeros in there, but it can still do something. So you can still end up with a smaller than if you've just stored uh, the, the, um, uh, these three vectors without any sort of compression applied to them. Um, and the chunking means that, yeah, you do get, it's, it's slightly, I guess the, the algorithms working in the background need to be slightly more complex, but essentially you can still jump in and read out the elements you want without having to read the rest of each of these vectors. Um, so it doesn't work quite as effectively, but um, yeah, you still get these benefits. And there's a reason why people still put a kind of sparse representation inside an HDF5 file. Um, and we'll see uh, in some of the examples this uh, as, uh, as we go on later. So yeah, the summary here, right, is um, hopefully um, I've convinced you that there are people thinking about this problem and things, um, but there is no clear consensus in the field for how to store these single cell data sets, right? Should they be in one folder 
with lots of different files? Should they be in one file? Um, what representation should we use to store these? Should they be dense matrices or should they be sparse matrices? Um, uh, should you zip them up? Should you use some other compression algorithm that's bespoke for your particular software? Um, there isn't a consensus. Um, and so this is challenging, right? You guys have probably already encountered that before. Um, and at some point, I suspect we will um, settle on something, but we haven't got there yet. And it's been quite a few years of, of people working on this. Um, probably HDF5 has the biggest market share um, in terms of there are several bits of software, but each of those produce a different format of HDF5. Um, so even if you kind of are aware of that, it's still useful to, to know um, where the original sort of the original source of an HDF5 file was. Um, and there are different properties uh, within that for how the data may be laid out and that kind of thing. Um, and if you're considering writing them yourself, um, and this is whether you're using HDF5 or any other file format, right? There's always a balancing act between many different competing factors um, for how you should go about doing that. Um, so if you want to spend time, uh, lots of time writing it because you know that that's a one-off operation and then reading can be really quick, you can make choices about compression levels and that kind of thing. Um, also knowing the specific use cases. So if you know you want to access diagonal information really frequently, uh, or if you want to access only columns um, and you'll never worry about rows and that kind of thing, you can use this to influence the decisions you make about how, how you're going to um, store it. Most of the time, I have to admit, people don't know that. They don't think about it. And I don't think the field has come to a consensus as to whether they more often want to know about groups of genes or groups of um, cells and that kind of thing. So we often end up picking a middle ground, um, which is some kind of compromise between the two. Um, and yeah, we will explore a little bit of, of, of that in the uh, exercises after the coffee break. Um, and yeah, really, the, the I guess the final point here, I probably should have put right at the start. But the reason we need to worry about some of these optimization things is because accessing data from disk is, is several orders of magnitude slower than if you've just got them in memory. So when you're worrying about performance and how long things will take, um, getting it wrong can easily go from seconds to hours or days um, without really realizing like it will work. It just will seem really slow. And if you haven't thought about um, these kinds of things or been introduced to them, you might have no idea that it's just a case of reshaping the data, how it's stored on disk, and you can get um, these great benefits that kind of will multiply over multiple runs through an analysis or something along those lines. Um, so yeah, hopefully this has uh, introduced you a little bit to uh, how people are thinking about this kind of thing. Um, and yeah, we will work for a few examples, mostly using HDF5 uh, after the coffee break. So are there any questions?